Hi, so this is a video for COM345. This is presenting assignment number two. Here on the board, this is the design diagram for part number five. This is only for part number five, which I'm gonna explain later. So here's the assignment itself. So first of all, the due date is November 12. So again, this is 10% uh, of the final mark. Uh, so this is uh, for the specific design requirements here. Uh, this is the same uh, requirements that we had before, except that for number eight, you have uh, basically it's stating that whatever was uh, stated in assignment number one, which uh, classes belong to which files must still be respected, okay, as uh, stated here. In this assignment, I'm adding more things to do. They must still be in these files, plus a few others that I will mention later. So there are five parts to be implemented. So let's go with part number one. So part number one is to implement a, what I call a command processor, as well as an adapter. It's a command processor. So as we've seen in assignment number one, so I was asking for you know, the game engine to work in a way so that the user enters um, commands uh, and then uh, on the console, and then this would eventually trigger some state transitions across the different states of the game. So that's essentially the same thing that I'm asking you to do, except it's a little bit a little bit more uh, complicated. <clears throat> so you must have this class called command processor. So what it does is that it gets command from the console uh, using uh, uh, so, for example, when the game engine wants to get a command from the user, it will call get command of the command processor. Now, this is the public method that the game engine would be using to get the commands from the user, from the command processor. Now, when you call get command, it should eventually read, uh, call read command method of the command processor, which will actually get a string from the user. Then uh, this uh, the command processor should contain a collection of command objects command objects are essentially just a, a, an object that contains two strings. What is the command that was typed and what is the effect of the command when it is actually executed after it's been executed? So you call get command. So, and, and then eventually it um, calls read command. Uh, which gets the command from the console and then save the command, uh, the, 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 the string of the command inside of the command itself, and then puts it into the collection of commands. Um, so, and then once this command gets executed, the effect of the command is saved into save effect. For example, if you load, use the load map command and the effect would be eventually to have loaded the command and created the object and so on and then going to the next state, which is map loaded. Uh, the command processor should also have a validate method that would, that would enable it to check if a certain command that has been entered was a valid command in the current state of the game engine. If it's not the right, if the command was issued in this, the wrong state, then it should save inside of the effect a message saying that this command was used in the wrong state. So that's it about the command processor. Now the command processor, the basic one is reading from the console. What I want you to do next is to implement what I call a file command processor adapter. This should work using the adapter uh, design pattern that we shall see in class. So this adapter, what it should do is to enable exactly the same functionality that I just explained for the command processor, except that it is an adapter that allows these commands to be read from a file instead from, as from the, uh, from the console. It behaves exactly in the same way, except that it reads the commands 
as strings stored in a file. <clears throat> and it must be implemented using the adapter design pattern. I invite you to uh, listen to the video about the description of what is the adapter pattern and how it works and what's it, what is its uh, structure. Uh, so in addition to this, when you start the application, uh, the application should have uh, accept a, a, command line, a command line argument, uh, which is either uh, dash console, if you want to use the default command processor that I just described, or if you want to use the file command processor adapter, you would use dash file and then the name of the file that you want to read the commands from. So then that allows the user, when you start the application, to either uh, read the commands from the console or from a pre-saved file. So this is the listing of all the commands that are possible to type uh, to be processed by the command processor. Uh, this is essentially the same thing that I've uh, uh, given in assignment number one. There are some slight differences, as you might see, for example, uh, I used to have a different name for the command here, so I made it a little bit more appropriate uh, uh, here. Note that uh, all those that are in red here, they are not commands, they're <coughs> uh, game events that are going to trigger state changes. With the ones, the transitions that are in blue are command, the transitions that are uh, triggered by commands that have been, uh, that have been read from using the command processor. Those that are red are going to be events that are going to be generated by the game engine. That's it for part number one. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all what the driver must do. The driver must demonstrate that you exercise what was said before. Then, uh, OK, so part two. This is the game startup phase. So what's happening in the game startup phase? Uh, okay, first, the game startup phase must be implemented as a method of the game engine, which is called game startup uh, startup phase. So you might all that it the game startup phase must be implemented in this method with this specific name inside of the game engine. What this game startup phase method should do is to let the user uh, create a command load map in order to load a certain map, which would then, of course, load the map and create the internal uh, the, the map inside of the game. Right? Then, of course, that would trigger a state transition to uh, from start to load uh, to uh, map loaded. Then the next thing it should do is to allow the user to use the validate map command in order to validate the map. Then the player should be allowed to enter the, the players, not the, the, the players that are going to play the game by entering a certain number of add player commands. Player, number of players in the game should be from two to six players. Then the user should enter the game start command and as you, uh, this command is received, then uh, five things would happen. First, all the territories would be uh, fairly distributed across all the players. Then uh, the order in which the players will play during the game is randomly determined. Then uh, third, uh, the, um, every player will be given a, uh, a 50 uh, initial armies that they will be allowed to place on the map when the game starts. Then uh, each of the players will get to draw two initial cards and put them in their hand before the game starts. And then once this is all done, then the game is switched to the play phase. So this is where we will eventually enter the game, the main game uh, play uh, state uh, of the game. So you see that this is uh, fairly uh, simple what the part two should do. So it's essentially implementing what is uh, stated here in the startup phase here, implementing the game mechanics for what happens for you to actually set up a new game. 
Part three is essentially uh, what's happening here in the box uh, below. Basically, this is the main uh, game loop. So this is the, of course, the more, uh, the most complicated one, uh, especially uh, to uh, deal with the orders, which is actually part number four. So part number three is to implement the whole game loop itself, the main game loop. And assignment number four deals with the, 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 the managing the orders in the main game loop. So for part number three, uh, what you have to do is to uh, implement first a reinforcement phase. So this is where, uh, so in the main game loop, what's going to happen is that each player is, each player is going to give, uh, be given a turn in a round robin fashion. So the first, and then once a player is giving their turn, then they will be given um, a certain number of armies. So that's uh, done in the reinforcement phase. So the number of armies that you receive as a player is the number of territories that you own divided by three rounded down. Plus, if you control all the territories of a continent, then you get the number of bonus armies associated with the control of this continent. And in any case, uh, the minimum should always be uh, three armies. So even if, for example, you control only one territory, you should uh, receive three um, uh, armies at the beginning of your turn in your re reinforcement phase. This must be implemented uh, in a method name reinforcement phase in the game engine. And the next thing that happens in the main phase is the issuing of the orders. So then again, in a round robin fashion, the players will be asked to issue orders. So uh, eventually what's gonna happen in this issuing order phase is that the game engine is gonna loop over all the players and then call their issue order function, which this function, what it does, as we said in, uh, in assignment number one, it allows a player to create an order and put it in their own order list. So this is quite simple, uh, but should be placed into a method named issue orders phase. Then eventually after all the orders have been created by the players, then you go into the order execution phase. So once uh, you go into this phase, which should be implemented in a method called execute orders phase. So what's happening is that the game engine again, loops over all the players in a round robin fashion, and then we'll ask them to give it the next order in their list of orders. And then the game engine would call the execute method of this order, which would then enact the order and uh, have, uh, implement the effect of the order. Implementation of the effect of the order is done in part four. If you're doing part three, the only thing is you're responsible here is to call the execute method. Uh, so this uh, game, main game loop continues until uh, there is uh, one player that controls the entire map in which case the game is going to be considered a win then you're going to, you're going to go into the win uh, state and then after you go into the win state you can enter the command either uh, quit or replay if you quit it exits the application if you replay it goes back to the startup phase and you can go right uh, play another game so this is giving uh, some more details about uh, the orders issuing phase. So this uh, explains what's the uh, meaning of the to attack and to defend um, uh, method in the player class. So for example, uh, when the game engine calls the issue order function of the player, then this is we're gonna create a certain order of the player's choice. Uh, for example, uh, so then it should be th th this, uh, uh, th the player is an, a computer player, so it's not the user that will decide what user, uh, what uh, um, order to be created, the player class will determine automatically, will make the decision automatically as to what order to create depending on the situation. 
uh, how will it make its decision? For example, let's say he wants to create a player wants to create a uh, a deploy order that is going to put some armies on their own countries. So how will it that the player determine on what countries to actually deploy the armies by calling the to defend method? The to defend and to attack, what they do is they return a list of territories. The to defend list of territories is the list of territories that the player thinks that they should protect. That's the countries that are to be defended. Uh, so somehow when you call to defend, it returns a list of your own territories that uh, are, are put in a certain order of priority, which one is the most likely to, or, 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 or the, the territory that you most want to, to defend in, in a certain order. Uh, and then uh, on the other side, to attack is a list of enemy territories that the player thinks that they want to conquer. So that would be the list that is returned by the function to attack. So you see that depending on what kind of order that you may want to create, you would actually use either to attack or to defend list to determine what is the target of the orders that you want to create. Okay. Again, I repeat, when you call issue order, the, this method itself will decide automatically what is the kind of order that you want to create. And every time you call it, it's going to create a new uh, order and place it in the list of orders of the player. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to explain everything here. I'm going to, of course, we're going to have discussions about this uh, in the um, in the classes in the lectures. So this is for this was for the order creation phase or issuing of orders phase. Then once all the players have signified that they don't have any more orders to um, to create or to issue, then game engine is going to go into the order execution phase. In which case, what it will do is it will ask all the players in a round robin fashion to give them their next order in their list of orders, and then we'll receive this order from the player and then call execute of this order. Now, it's important to understand that if the game engine is to receive an order and then call execute of the order, for this order to be executed, the order itself must contain all the information that is necessary to actually execute the order. So for example, if uh, the order is um, an advanced order, then an advanced order has some parameters somehow. It, it has a source territory from which the armies are moving from. It has a target territory. Uh, that this specifies to, to what other neighboring territory uh, the armies are to be moved, okay? Um, also, if you want to determine uh, if this is a valid order, then the uh, order itself must contain all the information that is necessary internally to enable the validation of the order as well as the execution of the order. So an order basically must be a self-contained thing that contains all the information that is necessary to execute the order. So, okay, so and then the game engine calls, uh, asks the players in a round robin fashion, what is their next order? Then receives the order, executes the order. Next player, get me, uh, give me your next order. Receive the order, execute the order, and then you do this until none of the players have any more orders to execute. In which case, you go back to the reinforcement phase, and then another turn begins. So that was for part number three, which is basically to implement the main game loop as depicted here uh, on the second part of the diagram here. Okay, what about part number four here? This is about the, the order execution implementation. 
<clears throat> so what is it that these, order, these orders will do when you call the execute method on the order? So here I'm not going to uh, describe everything in detail. We've already discussed that uh, before. Here's just giving more details as to what should happen. So you have the deploy order, the advance order, airlift, bomb, blockade, and negotiate order. So can I repeat, in order for these orders to be executed, they must contain locally data members that uh, enable them to uh, have access, for example, to the, 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 the source territory, the target territory, the number of armies that are uh, uh, involved in the order. And then each of the different orders have different parameters. For example, the, um, so the advance order. Advanced order has a source territory, a target territory, and then a number of armies that you want to move from the source to the target. So these are three parameters, two of which are territories, and the other is a number of armies. However, the negotiate order, it targets a player. <clears throat> so you see that no territory is involved in a negotiate order. So each of the different kinds of subclass or subclasses of orders will have to contain different information that enables them to uh, effectuate uh, the order, to implement the order. Okay, so you see that here, the only thing that is involved is to implement the execute method of each of the subclasses of order. Part five, uh, which is what I described here. So let me explain it in, um, in general before going to the details. Uh, so essentially here, I want to have a game log so that when the game is executed, then uh, when certain things happen in the game, then you have some entries in, the, in a log file that are created so that uh, as the game is executing or after the game has executed, you can actually open this file and then see what happened during this game. Now, there are uh, different things that I want to be logged and I have um, stating a very specific way in which this must be organized. So it's not about implementing a game log in any way you want. It's implementing a game log as I'm describing here. Okay. Very important to understand. If you just implement a game log in your own way, you will not receive the marks for this. It has to be impl implementing a game log in this very specific way. OK. So uh, first of all, this is using the observer pattern. So this observer pattern has been described in class. Please listen to the videos. Uh, describing the observer pattern. Uh, okay, so there, in the observer pattern, there's a subject and observer class. Okay? So you must have a subject and observer class as part of your implementation for this part number five. Uh, so using the observer pattern, you have to implement a game log class named log observer. <clears throat> so in your implementation, you must have a class named log observer. You must also have a subject and observer class. So these are in blue here, and this is your log observer that here is in red. Um, Uh, first of all, it should log all the commands. So as we saw in, in part number one, you have the command processor or the file command processor adapter that allows the user to enter commands. Now, every time the user enters a command, the operation of the game log observer, as I'm describing here, should be actually outputting to your game log.txt file what is the command that has been created and processed by the command processor. Now, how it will do it is that eventually uh, the game log observer should be notified by the save command method. So in your uh, command processor class, you will have a save command class, uh, uh, method as I described in part number one. So in this save command method, 
you should eventually call notify. Please again, listen to the video about the observer. In the observer, uh, it says basically that the subject class has a notify method and the subject class is inherited by any object that is involved in the observer uh, 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 pattern. So that means your command processor class must be a subclass of subject, which enables it to call notify in its um, uh, save command method. So you will have save command method. And then in the body of this method somewhere, you will call notify. will call notify. You will be able to call notify because you inherit from subject. Then as is explained in the lecture about the observer, what's going to happen is that the notify method, what it does is actually to call the update method of the other thing, which is the, uh, the subclass of observer. In our class, the log observer class must be uh, inheriting from observer. So when notify actually calls the update of the list of observers that are connected to it, then it will call the update method in this case of the log observer. And then in your update method, what it will do is to write something into the game.txt file. Okay. So again, that requires that you understand how the observer is working. So for example, command processor must be a subject and your log observer must be subclass of observer. So when you call save command here, it will call notify, which will then notify the observer, which will make it write into the file. Now, the next question is, what is it that it, it will write into the file? That's what I described here uh, in the fourth paragraph here. What I'm asking you to do is that every class that is a loggable class, I'm asking you somehow to create a C++ class, which is essentially some kind of interface, such as what you have in Java. <clears throat> the name of this class must be I loggable. And then, for example, your command processor class will inherit from I loggable. And then the only thing that I loggable class has is a pure virtual method named string to log which essentially forces this class here to implement the method string to log, much like when you have an interface uh, in Java, except that in C++ you don't, have, uh, you don't have interfaces. So essentially the command processor must inherit from subject and also inherit from iLogable. You see, this is an example of using multiple inheritance. So then that will force you to implement string to log here and then when you do the update of the log observer, then it will be able to use the string to log on the subject that was actually passed to the update method here. <clears throat> so that will force eventually all the classes that I will ask you to, to, to create as loggable classes to uh, use the string to log method that they are forced to use by inheriting the I loggable interface. Okay, so yes, you must do this for the command processor. So as the command processor receives a command from the user and saves it into the list of commands, essentially the history of commands <clears throat> that were given by the user throughout the execution. So when save command is called, yes, the command is saved in the history of commands, but also the uh, log observer is notified okay, by calling notify here. So that's one thing that's going to be logged. Then what you want also is when the command is executed, that uh, it is actually logged also. So that will uh, be done uh, when you have the command um, uh, save effect. So I'm basically saying here that in the command, there's two strings, which is the name of the command. And one of the, the other string is uh, the effect of the command. In order to save the effect of the command, you would call the save effect method. And then in the save effect method, 
after you save the string, which is describing the effect, you would actually notify the observer again. Okay. Of course, then that means that the command class must be a subclass of subject for this notification to work. And also, if you want the update method to use string to log, then this command must also implement, or not implement, sorry, but uh, um, uh, inherit from this interface class here that you have defined. So command processor uh, outputs the commands that are input by the user, and then the command class, when the command is, uh, the effect of the command is stored in the command, then it is actually also output in the game log. Uh, other things I want you to do is also that when in your game engine, uh, for example, you might have a set state method or transition method that actually enables you to change the state of the game engine. Now, what I want is that when this method is called that effectively changes the state of the game engine, then you actually notify the log observer, which will then eventually put in the game, uh, uh, game, the game log, uh, the game has now uh, transitioned to state for example, uh, issuing orders. Okay. <clears throat> so again, that forces the game engine to uh, uh, be a subclass of subject. And because you want to be using the same string to log method here, then this game engine must also implement the string, the string, uh, the, the I logable interface. Or Sorry, I keep on using the notion of interface in Java, but basically it must uh, inherit from this class here, which is an interface class. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's basically gonna make it so that every time you change the state of the game engine, you're gonna have something that's gonna be written in the log file. The last thing I want you to log is the when an order is created and put into the, uh, the list of orders of a player, then the order list, you should have a method that's actually adding the order into the order list. When you call this method, it should call notify, which would then put into the log file that this order has been created by the player. Then eventually when you execute the order, when the game engine executes the order in the execute method, um, it should actually, um, where is it in the execute? Yes, in, when the execute order is uh, uh, called, then eventually there should be an effect of the order that is created, which is a string. Uh, so when, after this has been uh, uh, set in, in the object, then you should call notify, which would eventually print out the effect of the order into the game log. Okay. But essentially what you must do here is to have each of these classes to be a subclass of both subject and I logable. <clears throat> Then have your log observer class, which is a subclass of uh, the observer class. And of course you implement subject and observer according to the observer pattern, which will make it so that when notify is called, it will call update of the log observer, which should then call string to log. And then uh, to get the string that is uh, stored inside of each of these here. Uh, uh, or that returns a string that is that that you want to output to to to, to the game log.txt file. So in order to have this, then you must make it so that each of these here actually inherit from this class here so that forces them, because it's a pure virtual function, forces them to implement string to log in each of these logable classes. So um, hope this was clear. Uh, if it's not, uh, I'm sure there are many questions. So the expectation here is that uh, during uh, every uh, lecture, I will reserve some time to uh, discuss and have some questions, receive some questions from you. So that's it for this. Thank you. Bye-bye.